Now I'm going to show you some technical details in case you want to build some contraption like this. This is pretty cool. First, of course, this is a motorcycle engine, 650 Yamaha Maxim. It's got a gear shifter. Don't look at the picture. That came off that knob came off a Chevette. It's just forwards and backwards, just like a motorcycle. One click forwards is first, half a click back neutral, and all the other pulls are back to get up to fifth gear. And you can see on the engine, instead of having the shifter lever horizontal, it's been shortened. And a linkage setup goes to the front. For steering, uses a small rack, like maybe you have a little car like a Suzuki or something. That's pretty good because most go-karts and small machines like this have a very quick ratio st steering turn and that's kicking back on the steering wheel while you're turning. Now I did check and there is reasonable clutch play. It's not a cable system, it's a linkage system. The clutch is right there behind that housing and it's slipping. It has nothing to do with too much tension on it. This is the lever that goes to the pedal. There's a couple inches of space there, so it may be possible to take the clutch basket cover off and actually get all the plates out without pulling the motor. Over there in the back of the motor is the lever that actuates the clutch and releases it. Now we're at the back of the motor, and you can see it better from this side. It's all working fine. Now the most interesting thing about this machine is, is the position of the motor. It's not in a great position to keep cool, so you don't get full airflow across the front of the cylinders like you're supposed to, and I think that's why it's burning oil. When you run an engine like this way too hot, you burn out the oil rings and damage the cylinder walls a little bit. Also it's shaft drive, so it has a jack shaft mechanism, something like in a snowmobile, but without a snowmobile clutch. So looking down from the motor, is where the dry shaft comes out in the usual spot in the back of a shaft-driven street bike. And a little short dummy shaft is added on there with a support bearing on this end and a small sprocket. Goes down to the jack shaft down there with an equal size sprocket. And another one pretty close to the same diameter which goes to the hub that drives the rear axle. And it appears to me that's some sort of locking mechanism. Limited slip differential. It allows the wheels to turn at two different speeds when you're turning corners, but when you give her the gas, it locks it up and drives both wheels at the same speed like a live axle. So there's another view of that jack shaft mechanism. And the imaginary axis point to design a system like this has to be right in line with the pivot point on the swing arm which you can see right there. Because of all the chain tension pulling and trying to suck that motor towards the other sprocket, this bearing box that supports the little drive shaft is well supported. And on this side is just some old caliper style brakes off the front of a motorcycle, but it works really well. Underneath the motor, running through a channel under the floor, is your three shifter mechanisms is your three lever mechanisms. One for the clutch, one for the shifter, and one for the brake. There's a little hydraulic cylinder for the brake. In the box on top of the motor is just the coils. Custom made sweet looking gas tank. I don't know if this is a factory made machine or a one-off homemade, but it sure is professional. I heard he paid, or his parents paid, $2,200 at an auction sale for it. Seems like a good deal because I I had to make something like this. Even with the professional equipment and start from scratch, it would probably take 1,500 hours. Now because of the poor design for the cooling system, especially when your shoulders are sitting there blocking the air, we have to rig up some sort of air induction cowling system to keep this motor lasting, because it's a good running motor still. I was thinking of like a big side scoop over here and a curved duct to blow it towards the motor with rear venting. That would really improve how this motor worked, especially in the summertime when it gets hot out. You notice the steering shaft is just plain and simple. An ordinary little universal joint like any car would have on its steering input shaft. So other than the lazy cooling system, 
There is one other serious design flaw with this machine. That is the steering angles. There is none. Every, everything is set at 90 degrees and that's wrong. You think someone who could do such a professional job engineering and building this thing would know something about the standard steering design and angles like caster, camber, and Ackerman's principle. The suspension works great on this machine. Now I'll show you what's wrong. I have an upper and lower ball joint similar that's in a car or an ATV. A spindle. You know that twists when you move the wheel. The axle shaft. Tie rod, tie rod end. And steering arm. Well first problem is this steering arm is put in a position exactly parallel with the wheel. Well that's totally wrong. It should be about 15 degrees pointed inwards on both sides. That's your Ackerman's principle. I'll show you how that works. With something like this with a fairly wide wheelbase, when you're turning a circle, say for example you're turning a circle that way, well that means if you could see the path the tires left on the ground, the inside circle of the corner would be a smaller diameter than the outside circle. So that effectively means that to turn that to turn a true circle, the inside wheel would have to be turning at a sharper angle to do that smaller diameter circle than the outside wheel. When you have that little bit of angle on those steering arms, it causes the inside wheel, no matter which way you turn, to always turn at a quicker radius than the outside wheel. And that keeps better steering traction when you have contact with your tires going around the corner on the ground. Next you want a neutral scrub radius. That means like on the opposite side of the tire, where the center part of the tire touches the ground, if you steered the wheel, the wheel would spin right on that axis. On this vehicle, since it doesn't have that, the wheel spins way over here, and the, the center of the axis is here, right below the two ball joints. So this has a wide scrub radius. So if you put a little, say, magic marker dot on here and put this wheel on a piece of paper or a little grease blob and steered the wheel, it would draw a circle or a half circle on the piece of paper. It should just draw a single point. It's a huge disadvantage of that. The wider your scrub race radius is, the more lever force bumps have and rocks and everything else is hitting your tire to fight you back with your steering. So that means when you're riding on anything but a smooth road, the steering's always fighting you back and giving you lots of fatigue and sore arms, and that's not good after an endurance race or lots of hard driving. So properly designed steering, the top control arm is set back. The bolts for the upper and lower control arm aren't in line vertically. This would be set back several degrees. This one would be a little bit more that way. To modify this, you would have to move that control arm back to about there. The way to know if your scrub radius is correct, if you drew an imaginary line between both the center points of the two ball joints in any vehicle, that's, that line, which should be at an angle like this, would come right out in the middle of the tire, like for example on the top. It would be right there, but on the bottom of the tire. Then you have it correct. Very many people put the wrong rims on their vehicles, especially on trucks with oversized tires and stuff like that, and your scrub radius automatically changes and it's no longer neutral. So off-roading can kick your wheel back in your hands very easily in that situation. Now we're looking at my quad. You can see where the top ball joint is. The bottom one's inset into the rim. So you can see that this is farther back than this. And if I drew a line, it would come out right about the center of the tire where the tire makes contact with the ground. And if you look at the steering arm, you can see it's bent on that about 15 degree angle too. Correct. And if you look at the steering on any motorcycle or bicycle, you can see it's always on an angle. That causes it so that when you let go of the steering wheel, the steering wheel always brings itself back to center when you're going in a forward direction and makes the bike very neutral to drive even on rough terrain. The steering wheel seems to want to be in that position. And on a four-wheeled vehicle, like a car, or the quad, dune buggy, whatever, truck, 
when you let go of the steering wheel going in a forward direction, the steering wheel unspins itself and brings it back to center or neutral. So if you could see it without the tire, the top ball joint is set back like this compared to the bottom ball joint which is over this direction. So between the two ball joints, upper and lower, there's that slight angle. It gives you that nice neutral feeling to your steering wheel and always brings it back to center. So if Rick decides to keep this machine, I think I'll help him modify it and do that. If you want to build a machine or anything off-road or even a go-kart, completely consider those angles when designing your steering. They're very, very important. And just another point of view of the pedal setup. It's like three different size shafts running through each other. See the little levers? Very ingenious and complicated, but it works well on this machine. Someone designed it good. So get your welders out and get busy. Now you know all the tricks. I want to see the video of your creation.